Good afternoon. I think it's my first honor and responsibility actually to welcome indirectly Bert Einspruch, who unfortunately is today not with us, but who's watching via live stream. So I want to make sure that he knows that we're all thinking of him. Because without him and his foresight, this lecture series would have obviously not um, he said, well, this is going to be the first one that I'm missing, but then again, I'll be there in spirit and at least virtually. So I think I uh, wanted to make sure that uh, he knows that I remember him. It's now really my great pleasure to introduce our um, keynote speaker for today. Uh, someone I've known already for a long, long time. Um, and I think I might have mentioned this last time when we invited him and he gave a talk here at the Annual Scholars Conference that the two of us worked together in Southampton and then he respectively went to Indiana University where he became the distinguished professor of the M um, Pat M. Glaser Chair in Jewish Studies and a few years later I arrived here in 2006. Now, Mark Roseman is one of these highly unusual individuals in the field of Holocaust studies that normally separates itself out into those that are interested in perpetrators and those that are interested in the history of victims. But he, in many ways, has each one of these categories taken over uh, onto itself and has investigated them early on with a uh, really important book on the Wannsee Conference the villa, the lake, the meeting, he always has good book titles. I mean, how can you beat that one? The villa, the lake, the meeting, which was really about this understanding of the Wannsee Conference. How important was the Wannsee Conference within the larger context of the planning and implementation of the genocide? And then he took on um, another role as part of a larger project of elucidating really the Jewish responses to the Holocaust. So for a long period of time in, in terms of the Jewish responses, we were largely thinking of them as very passive uh, victims, but an initiative by the Holocaust Museum resulted in multiple volumes, and he spearheaded one of those uh, that chronicled really the history of Jewish responses from 33 onwards, and really illuminated the plethora of, of responses, of, of ways by which Jews comprehended, understood what was happening to them and the kind of choices that were available to them. So after perpetrators and victims, now he has sized upon yet another one of these categories where for all too long we thought we knew what we were talking about, the rescuers. And I think this is what he's gonna talk about, which is based on his most recent book, um, which is really, again, questioning these categories and then complicating them, then some, and then bringing us actually to a really interesting point that at the end where we realize that if we have a better understanding of these categories, we actually gain much also in terms of what it potentially can mean for us today. Now, uh, Mark Roseman has also received numerous awards um, for the various things um, that he has published, and amongst them, um, is the one that stands probably out tallest, um, at least you know, maybe in the way I look at it, is the Geschwister Scholl Prize, um, for many reasons, also for the name that it you know, obviously carries. Um, and it's one that in particular in Germany has to this day an, an incredible resonance. So please join me all in welcoming our very distinguished speaker and my dear friend Mark Roseman. How's that? Good? Uh, I want to, first of all, thank Niels. It's wonderful to be here. We were colleagues when he was uh, a young uh, scholar at Southampton. And somehow, 18 years later, he's still a young scholar. I don't quite know how he's done it. But anyway, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to see the wonderful facilities here, to see also what Niels has contributed to developing the initiative to meet Professor Osrat and uh, Professor Patterson and uh, some of the grad students and postdocs here. Uh, it's a real, real pleasure. And I also want to thank uh, all of you uh, who could be basking at home over the win over the Jayhawks yesterday, but instead came out. So uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm most grateful. Uh, on April the 12th, Lisa Jakob, a 43-year-old Jewish woman living in the city of Essen in northern Germany, wrote a suicide note. 
She'd learned that uh, she was uh, going to be sent on a transport 10 days later. She didn't know it was to Izbica, a little community near Lublin where many uh, German Jews would be sent and no Essen Jews would ever return alive from there. But she did already know quite a bit about what living conditions would be like on the other end of the deportation um, for reasons which I will return. The letter closes with the words, farewell, you good people. Everything that I am, I owe to you. Will we see each other again? No, no, I mustn't even think of that. You're Lisa. And on the 13th, the note was found by fellow inhabitants of the house that she was living in. Only it was a fake. Lisa Jacob was a member of an illegal group. She was indeed a Jewish woman. She was indeed slated for transport. Uh, at the time that the instruction came to the house, she happened to be in Wuppertal, with other, another town with other members of the group. They'd long prepared for the fact that she was liable to be deported. They, she drafted the suicide note in Wuppertal. It was taken back and found in Essen. And for the next 1,110 days, she would be protected at multiple multiple addresses living in plain sight by this group. On the 31st of August 1943, uh, another Jew from Essen, the 20-year-old Marianne Strauss, asked permission to go to the kitchen. She and her family were under the watchful eye of the Gestapo. Uh, who had arrived two hours earlier. The family was the last Jewish family in the Ruhr. This was 1943. They had been under special protection, had still been hoping against hope they'd be able to get out. Now their hopes were dashed. They were given two hours to prepare for transport. They were going to be sent to Theresienstadt. And Marianne asked if she could go down to the kitchen to prepare for some food for the journey. They said, uh, they said, uh, they could, without being able to say farewell. She left a suicide note, I'm not going with, I'm going to take my life. God protect you, Marianne, and slipped out of the kitchen, never seeing her family again. It was a fake. She had come into contact with members of the League of Socialist Life, this group uh, called, that called itself the Bund. That evening, having spent the day uh, wandering around the city, she turned up at a house that belonged to the group where one of the members was living in an upstairs apartment. Uh, and for the next 591 days, she would be protected at various addresses uh, by this group. Uh, and here's a note uh, in the diary of the founder of the group, a man called Arthur Jacobs, uh, capturing this moment at the very last minute she escaped disaster. In total, eight lives were saved, although much of what I want to talk about is not just about saving lives. And one purpose of the talk today is to describe a group that is virtually unknown, to show the range of actions that were possible, to ask about their motivation and how they succeeded, in other words, why they did it and how they did it. It's a, a, a particular story, uh, one particular group, but I want to, as Niels has already alluded, I want to reach beyond and make a couple of larger points, which I hope uh, have pertinence for a, a sort of larger understanding of rescue. The first starts from the fact that this is a network of people, and we're learning more and more in Germany and in some other contexts, how important informal networks were for facilitating survival. Group action, connections, passing someone on to someone else, pooling resources, these turn out to be very important. And yet our perspective on the rescuer is very much on the lone rescuer and the rescuer personality and the personality of the person who helped. I don't want to diminish the contribution at all, but a lot of the explanation of how people get involved, how they act, when they act, has to do with the connections that they have uh, with the network. And I want to show a little bit of how that worked. And that relates to a second point, and that is that making choices in the moment uh, is very different from looking back afterwards when you're no longer in danger, and when you also have the full knowledge of the horrors that what was going on. 
So the choices that people make on a day-to-day -day basis often feel different from the way it appears looking back later. This is not to do with forgetting. It's not to do with problems of memory. It's because you inevitably see things in a different light uh, after the effect. And so what I want to uncover a little bit because of the extraordinary documentation that this group has left behind is what it looks like in the moment and give some hints of how that might be different from looking back. And it turns out that perhaps more than any other aspects of the Holocaust, uh, our understanding of rescue is really shaped retrospectively through memory. Uh, what I'm trying to do is show the rescue of history, if you like, uh, to, to see how it looks. It's not always looking different, uh, and memory has an important role in helping us understand, but in covering also what looks different from the contemporary documentation. So if I have a larger project around this small group, which I also want to honor and recognize, uh, it's that. So they came uh, from the... Ruhr, they were a small left-wing grouping. They called themselves the Bund. This was a common uh, word uh, in the 1920s. It means League Federation. It's also the word for covenant. And I think uh, the, the sort of strong, almost biblical overtones were an important reason why so many youth groups in the 20s who wanted to emphasize their strong bonds used this word. There were a whole load of groups that called themselves Bundische Jugend. And many of the kind of attributes of those groups also uh, applied to this one. They were, though left-wing, uh, they tried to bring together socialist ideas uh, with those of Immanuel Kant. The leading figure was a man called Arthur Jacobs, born in 1880. Uh, he'd studied with the Jewish Kant scholar Hermann Cohen, was influenced by the youth movement, uh, by socialism. Uh, he was a charismatic figure. And after the First World War, he turned to adult education. And it's his, the groups that he attracted through adult education in the new adult education school in Essen, they were emerging all over Germany at this time, uh, that formed the nucleus of the group. The group that called itself the Bund, as I say, it has nothing to do with the more familiar Polish Bund that many will know, but obviously the, the roots of the name, the same roots of federation or league, uh, uh, come back, uh, are the same, had a double program. On the one hand, uh, they wanted to uh, be the nucleus of creating a better society, a socialist uh, society. Uh, uh, on the other hand, they also, in line with Kant's notion of an ethical imperative, wanted to begin uh, at the level of themselves, their own individual. They thought they had to live out the ethical community. So they saw day-to-day -day choices and day-to-day -day practices as very important. It wasn't just campaigning at the societal level. And that's important, I think, uh, in, their, in their story. They engage in all sorts of activities, adult education, experimenting, an experimental school for young people, um, uh, and so on. Another central figure uh, was Dora Jacobs, Artur's wife. Uh, uh, she was born 1894. She came from an acculturated and educated Jewish background in Essen. Uh, I should say that Arto came from uh, the Protestant community in Wuppertal. Um, she brought, as well as this uh, Jewish background, she brought something special to the group in that she, uh, as a child, had um, trained in eurythmics. Uh, and uh, was very motivated to develop a new approach to the body, to body training and gymnastics. And like there was a whole explosion of different movements, she created a new movement in the 1920s, a school, which in fact still exists uh, today and is still recognized as a school for gymnastics. And many um, in the uh, Bund came to it initially through an, an experience of gymnastics with her uh, and also with choral uh, movement choirs, uh, experiments, in a kind of theater of movement uh, in which individuals found their organic place uh, in a group. In 1927, the group created uh, a log 
cabin, the so-called blockhouse in Essen, which amazingly survived the war and exists uh, today. And this was their central meeting space uh, and uh, uh, also the central space for the, for the, uh, for the school. We don't know exactly how many uh, members of the group uh, there were because in 1933 the group burnt a lot of the incriminating records. Uh, we imagine that there were probably uh, 200 uh, regular members sc scattered through different groups in the Ruhr, perhaps 40 or 50 who'd swo sworn a solemn oath of commitment to the group who were the sort of core members. There was an inner circle of nine who uh, ran the group and many more who would attend uh, meetings uh, uh, and so on, but we don't know for we don't know for certain. It was very much a holistic community, uh, pursuing, as I say, the politics of the personal at the same time as seeking uh, wider social uh, transformation. They were anti-organized religion, but in many ways quite spiritual. And the, the low church Protestant background from the Wuppertal region that shaped many of its members, you could see also in this way that they're working on themselves and trying to improve themselves. So I'm already sketching some characteristics of solidarity, of worrying about the everyday, of commitment to larger change, which you can always Im already imagine uh, will play a role in this story looking forward. On the other hand, you have to say that this group of slightly quirky, sometimes a little bit twee, slightly spiritual individuals were not prepared for a Nazi onslaught. Uh, and I really think this is not a story that one can just eat. Of course, after the war, the group itself wanted to emphasize its credentials and its strengths, and, and they were absolutely justified in doing so. Nevertheless, when the Nazis come to power in 1933, uh, it's a shock. Uh, the, the, the group uh, is attacked in all sorts of ways. First of all, in the press, uh, uh, Arthur's adult education work is attacked. Then the SA, the Sturmabteilung from the Nazi party, storms their building and some members are beaten up. Then the police get involved, targeting particularly communist members of, of the group, some of whom uh, spend uh, weeks and months in concentration camps. Then the education authorities get involved, uh, 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 arguing that uh, Arto Jakobs was a communist. He hadn't been, but nevertheless, using that as a justification uh, to have his pension removed. Because Dora was Jewish, she was no longer allowed to teach uh, uh, non-Jewish pupils, and her school was shut down. The group was declared illegal. So very quickly, uh, within a few months, at every level, the group was being hammered. So. Uh, they had to think how and whether they could survive. And many other groups in similar situations uh, just folded at this point. Unlike those, the Bund did not fold. It learned to adapt. It studied and studied and studied what was the right way to respond. They went through all their papers and burned uh, all sorts of incriminating papers. And when you burned them, you had to have somebody else who was not personally connected to you watching over your shoulder to make sure that out for sentimental reasons you weren't holding something back uh, that might be incriminating. They reorganized their meetings, and they had uh, a special uh, system uh, of invitations like this one that made it seem like a family get together uh, and uh, at the same time let others know when they were meeting. They would have staggered times when they would arrive so that you wouldn't have groups congregating outside and so on. Every time there was a mistake, they would study it closely uh, uh, and uh, work out how to avoid it in the future. They also, because of course, it wasn't necessarily immediately obvious that there was nothing good in Nazism in, in, in 1933. Nazism appealed uh, to the worker in Germany. It promised a new kind of egalitarianism. So they had to study every aspect of its ideology to make sure that everybody in the group understood there was nothing 
good about this group. There was nothing uh, worthy about it. There was nothing that could be compromised with. And yet, of course, they did have to make compromises. And so they also thought through where should they stand up and be counted and where not. And they were careful. They didn't post leaflets uh, against the regime because they saw how quickly other left-wing groups were being crushed by the Gestapo because they uh, posted leaflets. Um, they didn't resist military service. So men were called up for military service. They went, unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses, who risked imprisonment and execution for not going up. So they were realists. They were pragmatists. They sought to protect their lives, but at the same time, they were thinking, how can we maintain our identity and ourselves uh, under the conditions of this regime? Where they really crossed the line to action is after Crystal, Crystal Night uh, in November uh, 1938. As you know, on the 9th of November, there was an explosion of violence across Germany entering Jewish homes, destroying Jewish businesses, burning down uh, synagogues, and so on. In the group itself, most of the Jewish members who had been part of it had already emigrated. The only ones who were left behind were Lisa Jacob, uh, no relation to Arta Jacobs, but a core member who was the star pupil of Arta's wife, uh, Dora, and Dora herself. And at, it was at this point that Arthur said to members of the group, we have to break out of our reserve. We have to break through the isolation of the Jews. In 1942, Tova Gerson, who was a member of the group, uh, although she didn't have very good English, decided to brave, brave it and speak to a church community in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. She'd emigrated there in 1939 because her half-Jewish husband no longer had economic opportunities. He'd gone to the US a year ahead of her. as She then came in 1939. And now she felt that she had to tell this sleepy oil town uh, what, uh, what the war was about. So uh, she described an incident uh, on the night of the 10th, uh, uh, the 10th to 11th of November when attacks were still in full swing. When she, uh, in this mission of reaching out and breaking through the isolation, visited a uh, family acquaintances called the Heinemanns, who were an affluent family in Essen. So she turned up at the house with a bouquet of flowers Outside, there was still a mob. Somebody came up to her and snarled to her, and you're still bringing flowers to the Jews. Uh, she managed to get past them. The main door was so damaged you couldn't get in. She got in through the maid's entrance. She found uh, everything destroyed, the, the carpets uh, cut, cut up, the um, curtains burnt, the, the sofas split open, all the glass destroyed. And the, two, and the elderly couple sitting there, frozen, um, uh, and gave them her flowers. I doubt there was a vase left to put them in uh, in the apartment. Uh, but nevertheless, gave them this gesture of solidarity. A day later, she and other members went to visit the Jewish orphanage in, in Dinslaken, another little rural town, to see what they could do there. Other members went to visit Jews who they didn't know but knew of in Remscheid, others in Mülheim, others in Düsseldorf, uh, all seeking to show uh, solidarity. Um, Tova, incidentally, went back to the Heinemanns to ask if they could provide some funds to help the, uh, the Dinslaken orphanage rebuild a little bit. And when she got there, she found that the couple had committed suicide. So it was a group effort. And it's a group effort not just in the sense that they were in multiple towns, but also that it was the solidarity between them and the sort of moral pressure that kind of gave you the nerve to cross the threshold and to reach out. Because it was a very, very nerve-wracking uh, step uh, to, to make. The first years of the war were a hard test uh, for the group. Uh, there were call-ups, so many of the men were being called up. There was the euphoria of victory, uh, the fear that Hitler would be, his regime would be in power all over Europe, 
and the enthusiasm of neighbors who were so pleased about these easy victories gave an absolutely massive sense of, isol of isolation and uh, of fear that, um, uh, and of fear uh, that um, uh, they, they would never get out. But Lisa Jacob was alerted to the fate of Jews who were in the Posen area who already in 1939 uh, were being uh, deported from Germany and dumped in the occupied area of Poland, the general government, and left to fend for themselves. And so uh, uh, Trudy was given a contact and begins a correspondence, an intimate uh, correspondence that goes until 1943, in which 30 to 40 members of the group sent parcels to this person, Trude Brandt, um, who uh, incidentally was a, a distant cousin of Erich Fromm um, and who didn't survive. And she then acted as a distributor of the goods that they sent um, to uh, other deported members of the community. The parcels, I think, uh, received until 1941 uh, a correspond sporadic correspondence goes on until 1943. We don't have uh, Lisa's letters, but quite a lot of Trude's letters uh, survived, uh, and um, uh, they're, they're extraordinarily moving. Two packages have arrived. I cannot tell you how much they warm my heart. The first to arrive was the parcel with the cardigan, sofa cushions, and yesterday the coat. What a beautiful coat. You sacrifice for me. How kind of you, and it's just right for me. Uh, and then she says uh, this sort of slightly witty, that is a little bit funny when I eat bread that I baked from your woolen jacket or potatoes that in a previous life were once underwear. In other words, she's bartering the things that they sent in order to, to, uh, to get foods. You can see in the letters her struggling to express gratitude and what the parcels meant. More than her own comfort, it was her ability to help others uh, with these goods. She had been sort of the, per the point person for aid from the American Joint Distribution Committee, but that had faded away because the joint was no longer able to reach them. And so now she was uh, using this as a last little bit of, of help. And we also learn uh, that it wasn't just about the material support, but about this sense of a connection, not just that she hadn't been forgotten, but also that here were like-minded people with whom she in many ways she felt connected in terms of ideas and value. And so it is important that new strength flows in from somewhere. In fact, it is essential for survival. To feel the warmth and proximity of people so similar to myself is like having a transfusion after losing a lot of blood. It is life-saving. That is not just an analogy or a phrase. It is the purest truth. Do you sense what you are giving me, how much you are helping me with the only kind of help that is useful for me, which I need? We don't know how many uh, were help like the group, but it shows not only that it was possible uh, to send parcels to occupied Poland, something that we hadn't really known, but also this important psychological and spiritual dimension of aid, which uh, I think changes somewhat our emphasis on the practical. Um, in fact, this was practical because for the effort that was needed to survive, you needed a, a, a psychological, moral wellspring of energy, and this could help provide it. In September 1941, uh, the Yellow Star is introduced for German Jews, and in October, deportations start from the Ruhr region. At that point, the Gestapo also introduces new penalties that were at first secret and then in November became known uh, of three months in concentration camp for those who were found helping Jews. Uh, but it didn't stop the Bund. They show solidarity with the deportees, helping them get together equipment that might help them survive in the East, Dora produced a medical handbook of remedies that one might help. They accompany them to the central collecting stations. They carry luggage for the elderly. Uh, and they show uh, solidarity in, in, many, in many different ways. Um, 
This is from uh, Arthur's diary uh, in November uh, 1941, a last exchange with a woman who was about to be deported to Minsk. Uh, uh, she wanted to thank him, and he wants to disburden her from gratitude and say that actually they should be thanking because she's given them just a chance to alleviate their sense of guilt of being somehow complicit uh, in this in this, uh, in this regime, which I think was a very advanced kind of thought uh, at that moment in time for somebody who was actually taking risks uh, to, to provide uh, assistance. Um, we have documents surviving from the group uh, which show uh, that they had an awful lot of knowledge what was happening, a report that gives the numbers that are being deported from different cities, and it's clear that they were reaching out to Jewish community leaders in different towns in the Ruhr, particularly in Essen, uh, and getting information, and then they were trying to inform others about the conditions, because they produced this report, which is sort of anonymized, but contains a lot of information uh, about uh, the transports that was ongoing. Interesting is, as well informed as they were, they didn't yet realize that murder was the policy. And so they you know, write in the report, the official rationale for the deportations is labor deployment in the East. This will be true, but is only a camouflage for the fact that one wants to be rid of them. So in other words, they're actually assuming that this is about labor still. And, I, and again, it's that difference between the vantage point in the moment and how it looks afterwards in full knowledge uh, of, of what this gigantic uh, project, uh, project was. We know uh, that they were trying to reach out because uh, in uh, 1942, uh, a, a German officer, Charles de Beaulieu, who was uh, oppositionally minded but was an intelligence officer uh, with, uh, with the intelligence section of the headquarters of Army Group West, was arrested. And at the time of his arrest, he had on him, amongst many other papers, a copy of one of the letters that Trude Brandt had sent from Poland to Lisa Jakob. So we know that they were reproducing these letters and circulating them so that other oppositional groups had a sense uh, of, uh, of what conditions were like uh, in, the, in the East. We also know, although it's not so well documented, that the increasing numbers of foreign forced labor who were often working in uh, horrific conditions in factories in the Ruhr, as you may well know, by uh, 1944, over a quarter of the workforce that's working on German soil is actually made up of foreign conscript labor. And uh, we know that they were also reaching out to help uh, conscripts. Uh, and in fact, a number of the Bund members after the war had rather sort of celebratory trips where they were invited to Belgium or invited to uh, Yugoslavia and fated uh, by those whom, uh, th whose lives they had helped save as, as, as conscript, as conscript labor. So on April 12, 1942, as I mentioned, Lisa Jakob, uh, who was the only full Jewish member of the group left who wasn't in a mixed marriage and therefore not still protected by the special regulations for mixed marriages that were in force at that point still, uh, the only one then directly exposed to the deportations in 42, she now goes uh, underground, by which I mean hiding in plain sight. She changes address. She spends two weeks uh, with, uh, with Bund members uh, in Wuppertal, in Mülheim, in Remscheid, further afield in Hamburg, back to Dusseldorf, to other cities, often accompanied by Bund members, sometimes Bund members who were on leave in uniform. That gave an extra level of security um, uh, to, to the next uh, address. Uh, and of course, when you arrived there, then there was a problem of feeding them. This was a time of rationing. And so the group, and this is another way in which a network was key, a group devised a system of pooling rations so that uh, each two weeks, another member of the group was responsible for boosting the ration cards available to the, to the host at that time. One of the most important steps uh, was the uh, fact that she didn't have an ID. Her own ID, of course, showed that she was Jewish. Um, but another Bund member, Elsa Bramersfeld, um, 
when she was away, claimed to her teacher's association that she'd lost her teacher's ID card. She sent in her details, but a photograph of Lisa. And uh, uh, she got back a replacement pass with her details and Lisa's photo. And Lisa wrote uh, uh, immediately after the war, the pass was my most priceless possession. Life and death depended on its existence. I carried it in my shoulder bag, which I never let out of my sight. At night, it always lay next to me. To grab it during an air raid warning or when a visitor arrived became a reflex. Thus, I managed not to lose it despite the years of disruptive bombing nights. And I think one of the things that I hope is emerging is when we talk about a rescue, what we're actually talking about is a series of gestures of help. Uh, you put somebody up for two weeks. You provide uh, rations. You help them getting an ID. You accompany them on a train. Many of the members of the group have a limited time investment. It may repeat, but it's continued gestures of help. At the end, yes, they have been rescued. But what we're looking at at the time is this series of gestures of help. On August 31st, 1943, Marianne Strauss goes underground, as I mentioned. The first few weeks she spends in the uh, blockhouse in this log cabin, uh, which still exists today with Sonja Schreiber. But then the group decides that you know, if there was a bombing raid and they had to leave the house, she was well known in Essen. She would be exposed and then they would. So she starts traveling, now spending a few weeks with one member after another from August 43 all the way through uh, to the end of the war, moving with different, different groups. Uh, a striking... Uh, gesture, one of those many gestures, from Greta Ströter, a member of the group. When Marianne first went into the, into the blockhouse, the Gestapo kept the rest of the family in a prison in Essen because they figured that Marianne would soon turn up and then they could deport them all to Theresienstadt. And so while they were there, Greta, under sort of some pretext of having known the family, visited them and somehow let them know that Marianne was okay. She must have given them something that was kind of an indication that Marianne was with them and Marianne was, uh, was, uh, was alive and well. And so when they were deported to Theresienstadt, at least her parents had the comfort of knowing that their, that their daughter, uh, and their son not, but their daughter at least, uh, was helped uh, by friends. None of them uh, would, uh, would survive. Both uh, Marianne extensively and Lisa somewhat partially kept diaries while they were on the run. And one of the big surprises from these remarkable uh, documents uh, is that uh, both took part while they were on the run in retreats and meetings from the, uh, from the, uh, from the group. This is a poem that she uh, that, uh, that Lisa wrote on the, on the cover of the diary. So the diary also has photos, but it's sort of written anonymously, so it's very unclear exactly what it's about unless you know what she's referring to. And one of the things that I've really struck me about both Marianne's diary and Lisa's account of taking part in these meetings is how important to them the spiritual and philosophical questions were that were raised by the group. And at first it feels... I mean, when, when uh, Marianne is writing, what is a Weltanschauung, a worldview? It, this sounds like highfalutin philosophical stuff for a Jewish girl who's in ri ri at risk of being murdered by Nazis if she's discovered. But in fact, what it revealed, and, and you could say there's a certain amount of escapism, of retreating into the world of ideas in your diary uh, when you're under threat outside. But at the same time, I think what it revealed was that what the group had offered them was not just a roof over their heads or some ration cards, um, but it had also offered them a spiritual place, a psychological place, a place where they could feel part of a thinking community where they, as interlocutors, as communicators, they were part of an endeavor to create a, a better world and not just a Jew who was being helped, uh, who, was, who was in trouble. Uh, when uh, Artur died in, in 1968, there was a memorial service. And at that memorial service, Lisa Jacob remembered a, a conversation from 1942. 
And she remembered, she said that on the first day of my legal life, Arto requested me in his usual manner to accompany him to the station. I refused, appalled, but he insisted. In this way, I received from him a powerful, unforgettable lesson. Don't keep turning around. You must get used to seeming harmless and cheerful, cheerful, even if you're feeling anything but. And of course, what she wanted to show was what an insightful and far-sighted person Arto had been and how he thought through the situation of those that were helping and had given them guidance. But in fact, when we read her words, what it reminds us is how much those who were being helped had to help themselves. They had to perform uh, calm uh, and normality every time that they got onto a train. They had to appear cheerful when they were feeling inside anything but. Uh, Marianne received, uh, by complicated means, news of what was happening to her family, extraordinary but true, and of course, but still had to live the life of the unencumbered individual whilst knowing uh, what, was, what was happening. So this self-help, uh, this ability to sustain yourself, to enact, to perform, uh, Marianne also made felt goods and sold them in return for rations. Uh, acquaintances held family goods in trunks, and she would occasionally turn up, take stuff from the trunks, so would the acquaintances looking after them, but that's another story, and barter them uh, in order to be able to contribute to the cost, that the burden she imposed uh, on, her, on, her, on her hosts. Self-help was very important. And in fact, Lisa and Marianne were also helping others while they themselves were on the run. So they were uh, organizing parcels to go to relatives and friends in Theresienstadt, even when they were living illegally. Um, and Marianne also uh, got the Bund involved in helping another Jewish woman towards the end of the war and finding somewhere for her help. And I think, you know, we understandably have this rather passive notion of the recipient, the person who is rescued. We think of that person who's floundering in the river and is pulled from the maelstrom, and they are helped. Without it, they would not have survived, but they had to do an awful lot uh, for themselves as well. And again, that's no diminution of the assistance that they were receiving. The last year of war is an ambivalent period for rescue. Uh, on the one hand, there's the promise of liberation. It's clear that Germany is going to uh, lose the war. On the other, it's the most intensive phase of war in which uh, a very large proportion of those who, on the German side who would die in the war die both at home uh, and on, on the battlefront. Uh, on the one hand, it's a period in which the regime is becoming even more radical and pursuing those who are in any way opposing the regime, particularly after the failed bomb plot in July 1944, with ever greater intensity. On the other hand, because uh, of the bombing and disruption of life, there are loopholes and gaps where it's possible now to pretend that you're a bombed out victim who's come from somewhere in the east and you no longer have your papers and couldn't they register you and so on. So it's a, a time of huge threats and also a time of opportunities. And this is a time in which another five uh, individuals are picked up by the group and rescued who are now liable uh, to, uh, to deportation. Uh, we don't know all the names, but we have a good sense of the, of the that there's at least five others beyond uh, Dora, who now goes into hiding, Lisa uh, and Marianne. Uh, some are hidden in the blockhouse, some with acquaintances out in the country. And of course, this also involves ration and foods uh, and, and so on. Uh, a number of the group, group members find their way down to the shores of Lake Constance because some Bund uh, colleagues had a guest house there. Uh, and by the end of the war, uh, that guest house contains uh, two Jews in hiding and 16 other members of the group who are uh, trying to see the end, of the, uh, the, the end of the war. And even at the very end, uh, oh, this is the uh, panorama of, uh, of the bombing destruction of in, in, in in essence, it gives you a sense of how uh, life, by 1944, how massively disruptive life was, which creates new challenges and risks for the group, uh, but also new uh, opportunities. 
Uh, even at the very end, so this is the last day before liberation of the, this is a diary by Dori Jacobs, uh, a day, a Sunday we won't forget. Uh, and uh, I, I dare you to try and read this Sutulin handwriting. Every time I have to reread it, I have to kind of relearn re 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 it. It's absolutely impossible. For those who are wondering what the beginning says, it says, Ein Sonntag, den wir nicht, nicht abbreviated for Gessenberg. Now, Sunday we won't forget. Um, that's impossible handwriting. So they were together in, in, in Merzburg waiting for the end of the war. Uh, the Waffen SS uh, was pulling back through that area, and they happened to set up on a hillside opposite the house. The French army, which was the, the area that liberated this region, was coming, and shells were going backwards and forwards, and they wondered what they should do, whether well, they should put up a white flag so that the French didn't shell their house, but if they did that, they might be liable being attacked by the, the Wehrmacht, so in the, by the Waffen SS. So in the end, they had to make a call, and they do put up a white flag, but of course, then there are hours, they get a phone call from the other side of the valley, for God's sake, get that down, you're going to be uh, shot, but they, they take the risk and uh, uh, they've got their uh, stuff ready in case they need to flee, uh, but they, uh, they, the Waffen SS pulls back uh, and they survive. So right to the last minute, uh, they, they, are, they are in, 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 in danger. All the people protected by the group survived, and in fact, all the members, the core members of the group also survive, although some of the children who are in armed service uh, don't uh, and are killed. In the early post-war years, the group recognized that its claim to be, to play an important part in rebuilding a better Germany might lie now on its being able to establish what it had done during the Nazi period. And so uh, the group begins to produce some reports uh, on uh, the work that it had done uh, in assisting uh, others. And these are in, often also useful. They, uh, re they reinforce our sense from the wartime records. They emphasize the group effort, the way that they shared burdens and information, the way that they'd given each other courage and stiffened their background and demanded investments from each. Uh, and they emphasized also the way in which the commitments uh, that, they, that they had developed, the, the everyday commitment, this willingness to take everyday gestures, the politics of the personal, uh, the politics of the feasible, um, uh, had, had, stood them in, had stood them in good stead. And they also noted those aspects of their, um, their pre-war life that had turned out quite accidentally and quite fortuitously to camouflage their activities. For example, the fact that they had shared group houses meant that they had a space where they could meet uh, relatively unobserved. Uh, the fact that they were, had, were in many ways not an organized political party and, and had and had, and then of course had destroyed their records, reinforcing that, created or reinforced the virtues of being a sort of tight-knit but yet informal group. So they had the virtues of informal sociability but tight-knit which gave them uh, solidarity to, to help others. Um, they, because they had this strong a uh, group of people who joined who were into gymnastics and physical training, that gave them camouflage, which made them look like a harmless uh, 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 sort of physical training and exercise group. And some of those exercises didn't look so different from those of other groups who'd in fact embraced the Nazis. So it gave them a bit of cover. Because of the importance of gymnastics, a lot of the people who'd come into the Bund were women. And... Uh, uh, the Nazis didn't take women seriously as political animals. And that, too, creates a sense that this is a sort of harmless group of friends who are not really up to anything. So all these kind of aspects of their informal selves had, had helped to camouflage the significance of, of what, they were, what they were doing. Now, uh, this is the most recent book, uh, uh, one of the most recent books, uh, of uh, about rescue uh, in, in Germany. And you'll notice the subtitle, Individuals versus the System. 
Um, and this, incidentally, uh, Mordechai Paldil used to be the director of the rescue uh, part of Yad Vashem, as many of you all know, a very important figure. But nevertheless, it reflects that understanding of rescue that we have, that it's about individuals. Whereas I think one of the things that's emerged from the last uh, 10, 15 years of research is that very often you needed 10 people to rescue one. In, in, in Germany. You had, to, in fact, to have a network. The network provides the resources, the rations, the housing when one place is bombed and you have to move. There are very few people, well, Anna Frank didn't survive. There are very few people who survive in one, one place. People move. Uh, so often, uh, what you're talking about is not a single rescuer, an individual, but you're talking about networks who invest uh, energy, courage, uh, commitment, but nevertheless, it's not like the classical model that we think about. And it varies enormously from town to town and place to place to what was possible. So, for example, in Munich, the groups that were involved in helping the small number of Jews who survived there tended to be middle class figures, reasonably affluent, with sizable houses. In Berlin, it's very often the underworld, the demimonde, uh, a kind of shady uh, prostitutes, criminals, swindlers, and so on, uh, who, who are in this world already a bit detached from the system, uh, assisting uh, those. And here in the Ruhr, uh, if, if some people survive, then it's often this more left-wing uh, left scene. So local conditions and so on. I think we've realizing, too, that very often the way that we've approached the rescue and thought about the rescue is we've wanted to find a particular kind of hero. And of course, that started also in Yad Vashem it is an official program of recognizing the, the righteous. But that model of the righteous, although I think it's a wonderful program uh, and, and that deserves to continue, has in some ways misled us for thinking the way to explain action is to start with the personality and a kind of special person and then work backwards that, of course, because they were a special person, they did this. Whereas I think we have to start forwards from the time in terms of thinking about actions and opportunities and who's there and who's connected to who. There are some very, very special people involved. Uh, there are people who provide leadership and others follow. There are people who find great courage and others who do smaller steps with smaller courage. There's a continuum, but there's a huge range of actions here. And if we're actually tracing the ways in which Jews end up surviving where they're able to survive, then it's through a whole series of different kinds of actions and figures. And we can't explain that through the grid of the righteous or the special personality or the, the, the gifted individual, though there are those very much who are involved. And this, this what was a gift from this group was having so many moments where you gain glimpses from the contemporary. I mean, I admire this group enormously, so I don't want to detract at all. But I know that there were all sorts in the group. There were some who were rather skeptical about Jews and Judaism. And there are others uh, who are not. There are some who are very courageous and will do anything. And there are others who are very nervous but are persuaded to make a gesture. There are some who are in it for the long haul. And there are some who are uh, in it for two weeks. Uh, but understanding the trajectory requires that one sees the full range, uh, full range of actions. So I just want to give, and I, I, I'm coming towards the end, but I just want to give you a couple of examples of the way in which I think this contemporary perspective um, opens up uh, a, a different way of seeing. I mean, let me talk first of all uh, about Tova Gerson and the flowers for the Heinemanns. Assuming the Heinemanns had survived the war, uh, and as an elderly German-Jewish couple, it wasn't that likely, and then, of course, they tragically took their own lives. But assuming they'd survived the war, would they have remembered receiving flowers from Tova Gesson? Maybe, maybe not. The following day when she went to Dinslaken and somebody 
uh, wasn't able to buy because the shopkeepers weren't selling to Jews and she went and bought some stuff and brought it back. Would he remember later that she'd done it? I'm not sure. These are small gestures. They're very, very far from rescue. And yet, I think they're very important. Partly, there are thresholds that are being crossed here for people who would do, do something even braver. But partly, in fact, the nerve that was required to go through the baying mob and deliver those flowers was actually as significant as the courage that was required to pool rations that actually did lead to survival. Now, of course, the outcome is very important. If no one was saved, what was the point of it all? I don't want to diminish the importance of emphasizing the outcome. But at the same time, I think we need to recover that vantage point at the moment where people didn't even know that this was all ending up in murder. They didn't know what the outcome was going to be, but nevertheless felt called upon uh, to make gestures of help. A second example. After this wave of help that the group has been giving to uh, Jews after Kristallnacht, in January 1939, Arthur Jacobs, the sort of group's leader, writes to his son, who is half Jewish, because Dora is Jewish, and who's emigrated to Holland in the hope that he have more professional opportunities there, what they've been doing. And Arthur says, you know, uh, he talks about the, the, the value of what they're doing. And one of the things that he sort of feels most inspired by is that the People are rejecting the old way of simply seeking a pleasurable life, a good position, riches, security, and affluence. And uh, they, they, they've turned, they're seeking something more meaningful, a real life. I don't quite know how to read that. You might see it as an anti-Semitic trope that here were these Jewish businessmen who have been very materialistic and suddenly we're helping them find their, their, their better or their higher selves. Or maybe it's just a more general sort of anti-capitalist spirit and we're these materialist individuals and we're helping them find themselves. But it's very interesting that that should have been an inspiration in 39. Now, that will never appear in 1945. When you know that Auschwitz is is where this is ending up, you're never going to say, I see a real virtue in what we did in helping people find their immaterial, immaterial selves and their spiritual selves and getting over. That, by 1942, that was pretty well unsayable. By 1945, that was absolutely impossible. In other words, what we uncover in trying to understand what make, makes people tick and why they act at the time is, is, is sometimes the same and it's sometimes different. Um, uh, so I, I think this contemporary perspective can be very rewarding. Um, what, one other point. You know, because we start with the success of these groups, and quite rightly so, we imagine them, we see them as agents who make something happen, and they are. And what we want to understand is how they found the will to act and how they were able to act. And that's, we want to uncover that, and we want to package that in a way. You know, what does it take to be a rescuer? Uh, as I said, in some ways, we can't package it because it's so dependent on opportunity and context and group and so on. It's not something that you can package. But even if, assuming we could, what I think that doesn't see is what the experience looks like from the protagonists themselves. Because what their experience is, when we look at the contemporary perspective, is that they don't help, and 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 they help, and they don't help, and they don't help, and they don't help. In other words, when you are surrounded by a genocidal project on this scale, 99 times out of 100, you don't act. You can't act. You cannot possibly help more than a tiny fraction of times and a tiny fraction of people. There's no, there is no possible way in which your experience cannot be 99% of the time the utter demoralizing passivity and powerless of not being able to act. And that's why Arthur says, we should thank you. And this is a diary entry where he was sort of going to the, he was going to go to the synagogue to reach out and help. And turned around because he realized he couldn't do for anything for anybody. And I think you know, when they 
when the helpers came out of the war, because we often think, well, why were they silent? Why, didn't, why wasn't more said? Well, because on the one hand, yes, they had done something remarkable. But on the other hand, they also knew uh, how powerless uh, they, had, they had been. Again, it's a contemporary perspective that one recovers when we're not just looking back from the celebratory vantage point, but thinking about the experience uh, at, the, at the time. And in some ways, that the notion of rescue itself uh, is a little bit misleading, as I say, because in the end, someone is rescued, but actually, they're not just being pulled out of the water. They're being helped, and then they're receiving another bit of help, and then they're helping themselves, and then they're showing initiative, and then there's a point where they might be gravely at risk, and someone else provides accommodation, and then in the end, wonderfully, they have survived, and they know how much they owe those who've helped them, and they're probably also conscious of how much they've had to do. Rescue, the whole way in which we've really thought about rescue is so retrospective. It's so looking back. And of course, it's because, quite rightly, we want to recognize those who uh, didn't just go with the flow and who didn't just uh, allow things to happen and who didn't participate uh, in murder. And I think that's, that's absolutely right and important. But we, in doing so, we've imposed this grid of the sort of celebratory backwards look well, we have to reverse Kierkegaard a bit. Uh, history can only be looked at backwards, but it, it, it actually, to understand it, we have to live it, to live it forwards in a way, to, to see what the perspective was in the moment. Let me finish, though, uh, with, a, with a celebratory moment uh, and just how important these small gestures were. And after the war, this was a letter from a woman called Isa Hermans, who'd been a doctor with the Jewish community, uh, in Dusseldorf uh, and had been deported uh, to Theresienstadt. Uh, uh, Elsa Bramersfeld, who was a member of the group, had worked with her in assisting Jews before deportation. And after uh, Isa was deported, Elsa uh, sent regularly, and others uh, sent regularly parcels to Isa uh, to Theresienstadt. Uh, and, and now from Degendorf, Isa writes, you must hear it from me again and again, and allow me to tell you again and again that these parcels from outside gave me the will to survive, gave something so horribly meaningless some meaning, somehow held me steady. In short, they helped immeasur immeasurably. Again, reminding us it's not just about the material aid, but it's also about that spiritual moment of not being those small gestures of not being forgotten, uh, of somebody taking the trouble uh, to reach out. It was just a drop in the ocean, but nevertheless, what an important drop it was. Thank you very much. We have now some time to take some questions, and we have microphones to help us. Here's one. Oh, we have one from Dr. Patterson. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of it. So I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. That was that was fascinating and uh, engaging and extremely important. I think that uh, you have brought to light something uh, that the very few people engage, namely the, the the not just the importance of rescue, but the importance of help. Right. Um, and, the, and the smallest gesture has an immeasurable impact, like, like we see right here. In, in Victor Klemperer's diaries, he claims that the, the SS agents would put on a yellow star, just wander around the streets, and if somebody offered them a kind word, they'd get busted. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case or not, but this is what Klemperer claims. But this, it, what you bring out here also is not only something about the, those who help, but something about the evil that they're surrounded by. Mm -hmm. When kindness itself mm -hmm. is prohibited. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is extraordinary, mm -hmm. I think. No, so, I mean, thank you for, for your talk. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. 
Um, I have a question about uh, how German young people today think of what Germans did during the war. In the, and because what you bring up is you know, something I have heard of before. There was another talk about a year or so ago that brought up the Bund, and I didn't know anything about it. And I think the, you know, the tiny gestures that you refer to, uh, you know, there was one I always remember about a woman who said, well, I didn't do a salute, right? Something that, you know, I mean, the issue of bravery, I think, is, is in incredibly important. But there's a lot of, um, that there's quite a lot of information around today about how young people want to sort of see Germans as victims themselves. And so I wonder how this information is perhaps being used to support that kind of uh, uh, thinking today, and if you have any comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I mean, uh, of course, there are, there are a series of different direct, direct, uh, generations. So young people today and now, uh, what they're relating to is their great-grandparents often. Uh, so I would say there was clearly a strong rejection of what the parents' generation had done in the 60s from, on the part of the student movement. Then from the 1980s, there was sp powerful state involvement in West Germany in trying to render everyday life in Nazi Germany more intelligible. And I think there was a generation of young people who came out in the 80s and 90s who then uh, really were very attuned to the everyday participation in uh, in the Nazi system. And of course, from the 90s, the Holocaust also becomes more central in that. At some point, however, there becomes a generation for whom this is old hat and who are sort of frustrated that they're having to do this again. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a little bit of, I think, of, of pushback. So if you're asking me now exactly where we are in amongst young people of school age in Germany now. I think it's very complex. There's, uh, there's also, of course, uh, uh, tensions around uh, migrant communities in Germany who come with their own uh, attitudes uh, and assumptions and who are not necess don't necessarily yeah. feel that they need to shoulder the responsibility of re remembering the German past and may have been learned from their elders to be skeptical about uh, whether all this is, is true. And that adds another complicating facet. And then there's the young people who were perhaps born after 1990, but are influenced by parents who uh, had worked in East, former East Germany, uh, and who were suddenly confronted when reunification came with the centrality of the Holocaust in story of memory, whereas what they'd always been taught about was the left-wing socialist heroes in the resistance to whom they were the honorable heirs because they were citizens in, in East Germany. So, the, the answer is it's very complex now, I think, in terms of placing. But I'm still full of admiration for all the pedagogic work that goes on in Germany. I'm on the board of the House of the Vanze Conference. And the number of training courses they do, people who are coming in who are policemen or going to be policemen, lawyers who are going to be lawyers, civil servants, and so on, the number of courses and classes and so on, alerting people to the dangers of simply going along, of what can happen when the state goes wrong, of making individual ethical choices and so on is remarkable. So, um, you know, it, these days, it, the speed of change is so disturbingly fast, all bets are off. But in terms of the amount of effort that's still being done in, in in presenting these issues at all sorts of institutional levels, I think is fantastic. So I was wondering, um, in your research that you did um, on this group on the Bund, uh, I would imagine you've come across and uncovered other groups, other networks that you know performed sim you know similar acts of kindness. I'm just wondering if you have any idea, any estimates of how many networks like this existed in Germany and in Western, Euro Western Europe, France, and, and Holland, and how many people were involved in performing these acts of kindness? Uh, I, I can't give you the, the numbers for Western Europe. And then in, in Germany, groups exactly like this that were able, that were formed in the 20s 
but were sufficiently low profile to make it all the way through the war, but relatively small. Um, there are some left-wing groups uh, like the, the uh, International Socialist uh, Kampfbund, uh, which was a slightly more higher level, Leonard Nelson also combining socialism and Marxism they're doing similar things in the early 30s, but they're just that bit higher profile, so they can't stick it out. They have to, they have to leave, and most of the group members then go uh, into, into exile because they're too much under threat. So uh, it, it, it's an interesting, a sort of high-minded, relatively sort of pr provincial level grouping. It's very distinctive. What then you find is groups like the Kaufmann Group in Berlin, networks that form during the Nazi era around helping Jews. So these are not pre-existing groups, but they operate often in a similar way through informal networks and, uh, and investment and housing and so on. And we know there are a number of those in different cities, and quite a lot of them don't survive. I mean, the Kaufmann Group uh, is denounced, and then unfortunately they weren't as careful, and when Fritz Kaufmann himself was, was caught, he had a list of addresses in his pocket, and so the whole thing was, was wound up. So, quite, so there are a number of groups that start like that. In Berlin, there are Lots of, because that's where most of the Jews survive. So probably sort of three, 4,000 Jews survive within Germany. And of that, 1,500 or more survive uh, in, in Berlin, which is probably maybe a quarter or a fifth of those who try to have a go at surviving underground in, in Berlin. Elsewhere, we're talking about the Jews who survive as just a few hundred. And so then there are tens involved in, in, in protecting um, so, the, so the answer is, uh, if, you, if you widen it to include informal networks, then there are some thousands of, of Germans who are involved in one level or another. Uh, in terms of organized groupings like this, who have a sort of pre-existing political identity, then it's a very small number. Then they really stand out, stand out more, because the, those groups that had a, a strong political identity uh, were more exposed and they had to, they had to leave. But there are some. Uh, there are some other left-wing groups. So they're ones probably talking about a few hundred at most uh, members who are in some way connected to those. Once you look beyond uh, uh, Germany, I mean, there has been work. Obviously, we're talking several thousands. But of course, again, it's still a, a small minority. There, what's different, though, I mean, I, that's one point I should have made, uh, uh, though, uh, uh, and didn't. What's different, of course, and this goes back to, to David's point, is in Germany, you're surrounded by people who, even if they're not particularly pro-Nazi, they're rooting for the country that's at war and for it to win. And so you're on the wrong side. You're against the state. Whereas, uh, at least in, in Holland uh, and in Belgium, uh, you, you you at least you're against the occupier. You can be a patriot uh, and be and be helping Jews. It's much harder to be a patriot and help Jews in Germany. I mean, I'm not saying it's necessarily easier. Obviously, in Poland, the treatment for those who help Jews is so much more draconian. I mean, it, it, there, there are some people who are killed who help Jews in Germany, but there are others who are found who are not killed. In Poland, that's unthinkable. You get killed, your family get killed, perhaps your neighbors, the community. Is, I mean, the, 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 the level of violence against those who assist Jews in Poland is so much more massive. And that means, and because it's widened to those who didn't turn them in, that means if you get to know about somebody else who's helping in Poland, you're already, you have a massive risk that you're having to wait. That's a very different, uh, a different situation. But in Germany, the problem is you're surrounded by people. You're the anti-patriot. You're breaking, you're breaking the law. So, that is, so, so in that way, it's a very distinctive position that, uh, that they find themselves in. Hi. Hi. Um, so I wanted to know, in your research, did you find, through studying this group, elements of how they were able to identify one another to the Jews that they were helping? Um, you talked about that they would kind of go and switch off. But how do you identify someone if it's a hidden group and you're hiding as a Jew? Um, and then 
I guess a secondary question would be from the perpetrator's perspective, right? The Germans that were there, are these people seen as patriots? Or, and as historians, how do you identify whether these were Nazi supporters who had a friend that was a Jew that they wanted to help versus actually being part of the Bund group, which was working to you know, kind of help as many as they could? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, the, the first thing is, how do you identify yourself? This is a real issue because uh, after Crystal Night, when they go out to offer help, uh, often the people that they want to help are very, very wary because they actually think this is a, a trick. And some are so nervous uh, that they, that in fact they, uh, and I think that's very demoralizing for the Bund because they, they want to help, they've taken the risk to reach out, and then they can't uh, because uh, that those are, are too fearful. So that is a that is a that is a continuous problem. And they, but I have to say that when they reach out, they reach out, and sometimes they'll sort of allow that or acknowledge that there are friends and they have friends who. But often they they present themselves as individuals. They don't identify the group. They're very careful in that way. So m many people who would have given assistance would not have known that there was a whole, a whole group uh, behind them. Uh, in terms of uh, are there also those who, if you like, would be ideologically predisposed not to help but have personal connections who do help? Absolutely. Uh, uh, there's, Every range on the spectrum of from outright anti-Semite to strongly predisposed towards Jews is, is on the scale of helping. There are so many different reasons why people, sometimes because they get asked, sometimes because they know someone. And in fact, one of the women who's closely linked to the Bundle, she's not actually formally a member, she is she and her family are Quakers, but she, her, her uh, mother was uh, Jewish, and so she would count it as half Jewish in the, in the Nazi terminology. Um, and uh, the reason that she survived is that her father, who was not Jewish, used to go to a sort of regular, uh, the Stammtisch, the regular sort of meeting in the pub at the local inn. And one of the members of that was in the SS but was uh, a, a friend and warned him that there was going to be a, 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 a roundup on a deportation the next day, and so that all the family uh, splits in different ways, uh, and that's how they survived. So we see that, and in fact, um, one of the unfortunate things that the Bund had done, uh, rather like the early kibbutz, was that they had, um, I'm trying to think, how, yeah, that they had experimented with educating the children away from the families, that the children were in a sort of a cabin in the middle of the woods, and then Bund members would go and teach them. And for some, this really didn't go down very well. The, the youngest of the children, whom I interviewed several times, was very, very scarred by, by, by this experience. But one of, the, one of those who'd been through that and was very alienated, his, his mother had, had remarried. He was very alienated from the stepfather, who was a kind of very heavy-handed socialist. So he joins the SS Leibstandarte, uh, and in fact, in the end, I think, committed suicide at the end of the war. But he didn't lose his sympathetic connection to members of the Bund. And so Lisa Jakob, when she was on the run, she met with him a couple of times and got some information from him uh, about what was going on. So personal connection, ideological connection. And actually, I think that's one of the ways in which the group itself doesn't quite tell its history right. Because the way that it presented itself, and of course it wanted to present itself as a potential rebuilder in post-war Germany, is we are the ideological group par excellence who motivated solely by a Kantian sense of wanting to help those in need, acted. And in doing so, they sort of buried the fact that they were so closely linked to the Jewish world. I mean, Dora had relatives. They, they, she had brought in, she had also been an enthusiastic member of the blue-white Zionist youth movement. She'd brought in former Jews who had then left in the 30s and so on. So that whole side of personal empathy that was important for them too had sort of gone. So I think you're onto something because I think that the story of why people act is, is never reducible to a single cause, and, the, and, and, and there are multiple ways in to why somebody ends up helping, and it can be 
the, the Nazi with a good school friend through, through to the out-and-out anti-Nazi who feels like they have to act out of principle. Right, then if you all please want to join me one more time. Let me just, let me just make two or three quick announcements. One is really critical. Tomorrow's lecture is not taking place here, but rather at Spin Gallery, which is on the northern part of the campus. So just make sure after today, I'm sure you will want to hear more of him, that you come to the right location tomorrow morning. And then secondly, um, we have outside coffee and sweets prepared, as well as the opportunity to acquire this book. Mark has brought all of his fountain pens with him and is ready to go. Um, so meet him outside. Thank you very much.